Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed your coffee break. Um, first of all, sorry that we didn't get to questions in the previous session. We will try and build that into this session and later in the day as well. And also, it occurred to me that our previous panelists, when in their presentations, had such great content that some of them had to skip over and they didn't really get enough time to present it as they wanted to. So we're going to make sure that that content is made available. Uh, it's going to be on the website. I think we have a slide with the website address. Can we put that up? The slide with the website address so that people can uh, know where to go. There we go. umpdp.org slash USPC. And so all the content from the panelists will be made available so that you can look at it at, in your leisure, in your own time, and really absorb all the good points that they were trying to make, but in some cases were squeezed and didn't have the time to do so. So session one provided us with a broad base overview of the kinds of consultations and initiatives and discussions that are being held around the post-2015 agenda and some viewpoints from different stakeholders. In this session, we're going to delve into some examples of implementation in practice at the national level in different sectors. My speakers are all lined up on the stage in front of us. Uh, the topics we're going to be looking at include the MDG acceleration framework in practice in Ghana, social protection floors and beyond, looking at a case study in Cambodia. We're looking, going to Mozambique to hear about disaster risk and reduction, to El Salvador to hear about public-private partnerships for health, and education partnerships on a global footing. The format of the session, again, will be that I'll invite the speakers to make their comments or give their presentations, uh, and then we will open the floor to questions so that we all get a chance to actually engage in the dialogue that is the purpose of this conference. So with that, let me start with my first speaker and invite uh, Shantanu, Dr. Shantanu Mukherjee to speak. He is uh, a microeconomist who heads up the UNDP's Millennium Development Goals team, and his team, in fact, developed, applied, and extended the MDG acceleration framework, which is currently in use over 50 countries. And once again, speakers, I would ask you to be judicious and self-edit and keep to your time slot so that we can engage in dialogue. Dr. Mukherjee, thank you very much. Thanks, Rajesh, and uh, thank you to the organizers, the most distinguished participants here, for uh, giving me the time to speak to you. As Rajesh mentioned a little while earlier, uh, you know, whether the MDGs or any other global agenda at all is, are achieved or not really depends on what happens in the country. And uh, UNDP and uh, many of colleagues here in this room have been intimately associated with this process of translating things into country level action. Uh, I'll take a little while to just quickly review what the steps have been in taking things down to the country. I'll speak a little about the MDG acceleration framework, but I'll leave it to Patrick from Ghana to give you more details. And I'll sum up by what, uh, <clears throat> what we've learned so far from this and what it looks like going forward. Now, we've already heard about the MDG timeline, so let me just, uh, and you've heard about things that started in the 80s and 90s and went on till 2001 when the MDG roadmap was put forward. Let me just speak a little bit about what happened after that. And uh, here in 2005 is when you had a, the review meeting on the MDGs. Uh, in the period from 2001 to 2005 and even after, there was a lot of advocacy around the MDGs. And it is at this review meeting that we started hearing about how the MDGs need to get into national development strategies and plans, which is where the real action starts at the country level. Um, in 2010, you had the high-level plenary meeting on the MDGs, and here this was a time to take stock of what has happened, uh, what the outlook looked like, and this is where um, special instruments such as the MDG acceleration framework or other initiatives such as scaling up nutrition, and a lot of these were at the sort of uh, inspiration of the Secretary General, uh, or intended to target MDGs that were not doing too well. This is where all of this action started happening at the global level. So this period from 2010 to 2013 has been a quite a period of ferment when it comes to MDG action on the ground. And I think there are basically three strands to look for in this period. The first is that ever since 2000, a lot has been learned about what makes a particular goal or target easy or hard to attain and how to do it on the ground. 
Uh, you see this in the global progress, but also in disparities within and across countries and across goals. An important realization in 2010 was that we were heading towards a period of slower global growth, and therefore a need to see how we could maintain the pace of efforts or even step them up when the easy route of more resources was perhaps not going to be there. The second strand you see here is actually a recognition that uh, all of this knowledge about the MDGs could be brought together in some practical and fruitful ways so that we were not doing what we were doing when we first incorporated MDGs into national development strategies, but rather refining and improving how we go about them. And I think a direct consequence of this are approaches such as the MDG acceleration framework, relying a lot on the evidence of what has been done, relying on being tested first in countries and then applied abroad uh, to across the world. And which brings me to the third strand, an improved understanding of what, what partnerships could do and what partnerships could look like when we talk of implementation on the ground. So by this time, we knew what the building blocks are for the MDGs. The first and most important is the national ownership, which uh, we haven't heard of very much, but is critical to ensuring that these get embedded in a country's national plan. So here is the challenge of adapting a global agenda to reflect domestic priorities. And although many see the MDGs as a straight jacket, it is also true that they got adapted in many ways. Countries added new goals, countries modified the targets, countries decided that primary school education was not going to be enough and they needed to put in secondary school education. So there were all kinds of innovations made. The second following from national ownership is having policies that actually seek to do what the MDGs ask you to do, uh, whether these are making policies more targeted and effective or trying to exploit synergies such as access to energy which helps you uh, actually address many of the uh, bottlenecks to poverty reduction. The third track that we see here is the willingness to report back on progress and results. We have over 400 national MDG reports and clearly these must have struck a chord somewhere in helping countries learn from what is working and what is not leading, of course, to the MDG acceleration framework. And finally, of course, we have the very important theme of partner support, which is, uh, I guess, one of the major themes of this conference, and how it can actually complement all of the rest that we've spoken about, how aid, trade, debt, technology, and knowledge transfers can help in each of these building blocks as we go forward. So what is the MDG acceleration framework? The MDG acceleration framework is an approach to help improve the way you're dealing with MDGs on which you're not doing too well. Uh, the first prerequisite for using an approach like this is that you have the required political leadership and national ownership behind the MDGs. In many countries, maternal health is off track, but unfortunately, it's not an important national priority in all of these countries. So would it be worthwhile investing in specific targeted efforts to improve it it would be worthwhile, but you have to ask the question of whether those efforts would be implemented properly. And so the MDG acceleration framework tries to make the most of national demonstrated political leadership on MDGs that are off track. It starts with the assumption that um, a lot has been done here and a lot has been learned. So it is time to focus now on what the important bottlenecks are that are stopping you from the interventions from having maximum impact. So if you're looking at getting children into school, perhaps you've already built lots of schools and trained lots of teachers. So the question to ask now is not whether you've built enough schools and enough teachers, but rather to ask what is keeping the children who are not going to school, what's keeping them out of school, and to try and address that situation first. Um, it works through a consensual policy-making mechanism. It uh, works through, of course, the national government and its partners. It tries to bring in inputs from NGOs and civil society. It brings in technical support from a number of agencies. And what is most crucial is that through this process, it charts out a partnership where each of these sets of actors has a specific role to play, depending on what they need to do. I think what we need to understand is that at this point in time, even though a particular MDG may be associated with a particular sector, Sometimes the impediments to realizing it are actually things that can be addressed better outside the sector. 
If a big problem in maternal mortality is that you don't have roads connecting emergency centers, well, you'll hear more from Patrick about this. Clearly one of the solutions is through some kind of infrastructure aspect which is not part of the health sector. The question then becomes how do you provide the incentives to sectors that are not primarily associated with the given MDG so that they respond to these challenges instead. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go over this, it's a slide, it takes too, too much uh, time, but uh, I just want you to consider this as part of uh, what you re read in the future, uh, because what the MAF is trying to do is to get at a systematic resolution of bottlenecks so that we're not taking a scattershot approach. These are the countries that have tried the MDG acceleration framework to date. Uh, Rajiv mentioned that there are over 50, that's correct, but uh, the number of action plans we have is well over 150. And that's because many of these countries have tried it first for one MDG that's off track, and finding that it works have moved to a second one. And in several countries, uh, such as Colombia or Bangladesh, these action plans are being formulated at sub-national levels, so they're reflecting actually provincial and sub-national priorities as well. You can see that they're targeting a whole number of themes that are of concern. Maternal health has the largest share of action plans. Uh, so, and other areas such as poverty, hunger, water and sanitation also receive their attention. What I would like to point out here is that many of these national plans are actually going beyond the sort of canonical set of seven MDGs that are to be done in developing countries. These are now addressing economic disparities, they address non-communicable diseases, they address access to energy, which I think are actually good precursors for what you might want to see in a future development agenda. So how does the MAF actually have an impact? I'll try to pull out three clear ways. The first, as I mentioned earlier, is that it really promotes working across sectoral silos. Not to mention that sectoral action isn't important. It is very important. But once you've reached the level of sort of diminishing returns through sectoral action, it is important to look at what are the constraints that can be addressed by going outside. The second important strand of work is that it helps address uh, inequalities. Here, I think the most visible and tangible examples are from the action plans that work at provincial and subnational levels, where on average, many of these countries, such as Colombia, have achieved the MDG target on poverty, but the pockets of poverty that remain are being addressed through these subnational plans, and it's actually quite instructive to see what kinds of constraints and bottlenecks operate for specific populations and specific regions of the country, which are quite different from national ones. I think this, there are useful lessons here for how we want to move forward to achieving universal kinds of goals. And the third point that I want to make is on the kind of partnerships that have been forged. Uh, I was struck by what Marilu said earlier in her uh, presentation on development financing about how um, there was a need to increase the impact of available resources as well as to leverage additional resources. In a sense, the MDG acceleration framework is all about increasing the impact of available resources. But we find that when we do so, it actually also improves the availability of resources as more people get interested in building off each other's work. So we have some examples here. The EU $1 billion MDG fund, which was launched in 2011, actually prioritized MDG acceleration framework kinds of plans for support. Um, the Korea MDG Trust Fund, which helped um, you know, translate some of this work in Colombia, which was done in a few provinces, to cover more provinces. And we also have recent very promising indications from other partners, such as the World Bank, such as the JICA, where there is no direct commitment of resources per se, but there's an alignment of programs of work around the priorities and action plans. And that is a really good way to get people working on a common set of goals through specific activities. So what do we learn when we look to 2015 and beyond? Uh, and what, what, what can we take from here? The first lesson, I think, is that there is tremendous scope for financing for the MDGs to have catalytic effects. We are finding that many of the bottlenecks, say, to maternal health are common across countries. And there can be solutions that are easy to adapt across them. For example, health insurance schemes are being rolled out in many emerging middle-income countries. 
Uh, in some countries, they're already there, but maternal health coverage is poor. Now, a solution to how to improve the maternal health coverage in existing health insurance plans, particularly to get poor people covered, would be a great solution that can be replicated across countries. We find that this kind of financing can help promote the synergies that we spoke about earlier, about one sector helping another, about connecting global efforts such as the initiative on special education or the initiative on maternal health down to country level. The second big strand of work I think that we are very hopeful about here is that we have countries going well beyond the existing development agenda. Now, whether these items actually feature in the new global agenda or not, we don't know, but they clearly feature in the country's own development agendas. And this is a great way to learn about what trade, for example, should look like in the context of non-communicable diseases. What should be the kind of patterns of uh, development assistance and knowledge sharing to address population disparities in income or achievement? Uh, just like the MAF incorporated the financial constraint of having a limited financial envelope and looked for solutions within that, we also see action plans that are incorporating and taking the benefit of environmental constraints. Many of the action plans for hunger that are coming out of the fragile countries of the Sahel in West Africa are incorporating sustainability elements, yet others are trying to see how uh, initiatives such as access to sustainable energy can have positive spin-offs in terms of social indicators. A very important lesson for us as we move, look forward is that uh, everything needs to be anchored in the appropriate domestic political institutions. While the negotiations are on at the General Assembly and will intensify after September 2014 on what a new global development agenda would look like, these negotiations are the purview of the ministries of foreign affairs. What happens on the ground is the Ministry of Planning and Finance. Uh, it took a while to make that link early on. We shouldn't uh, make the same mistake uh, this time around. And planning and finance will be even more important because we'll need to work even more closely across sectors and across ministries. And uh, finally, of course, the question of data. It's been talked about before. I think what we learned from the MDG acceleration framework is that even though the quality of data is uneven and a lot more needs to be done, a lot more can actually be done with existing data in terms of using it to guide implementation policies so that we are not looking merely at uh, sort of uh, data for assessment and monitoring, but actually looking at it for policy formulation. And here are some of the uh, ideas that were put forward by a panelist from the last round on process data might be particularly useful to build upon. So I'd like to conclude here with uh, a very quick uh, summary of uh, what I've basically said so far. And it's going to be a one-line summary, which is that the unfinished business of the MDGs is going to be important as we go towards post-2015. Part of that unfinished business is learning how to do things better. And here, I think we have real knowledge to help us take this forward. Thank you. Dr. Mukherjee, thank you very much. One-line summaries, I like the sound of that. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Dr. Patrick Kumar Aboagye, who's the Deputy Director of Reproductive and Child Health Department in Ghana. He's managed many flagship programs there in maternal, newborn, and child health, notably the high-impact rapid delivery approach to MDGs 4 and 5, and currently the MDG acceleration framework focusing on MDG 5. Uh, I'm going to invite you... Uh, to speak on the MDG acceleration framework in the Ghanaian context. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and thanks um, UNDP and the Korean government for making it possible for us to be here to share our experience. I think uh, Sintanu has already met, talked a lot about MDG framework, so I'll go straight to as to why Ghana chose MDG 5 over others. In about 2008, it became quite clear that um, we're doing quite well in MDGs 1, 2, and 3 and that the most challenging MDG was five and seven. We had made some modest gains in MDG four and six. And in 2008, we declared that maternal mortality as a national emergency by the, the, the government. At the same time, our maternal mortality rate was about 451 per 100,000 live births, and the decline was very, very slow. We also knew that tackling the MDG five was, was likely to have a positive impact on, on MDGs, all the MDGs, especially MDG4, and then the health systems. 
And so we also wanted to also focus on the bottleneck, but we knew that other things that are happening in other countries. We we're doing the same thing, but we we're really not making any success <coughs> out of that. The MDG, MDG framework, as we mentioned, actually proud uh, for Ghana, focused on three key areas, family planning, skill delivery, and emergency obstetric and newborn care. And out of the process came out the cross-cutting and health system issues that were also affecting our, our progress. The action plan had to be actually be broken down into a way that can be implemented. So we had to do uh, it in phases. At first, we developed a national operational plan with a multi-year plan, both at the national and the, the sub-national level, before the full implementation. Now, what were some of the key implementation strategies? There were a couple, but these are all part of the plan. One was the governance issues. We ensured that there was a multidisciplinary um, steering committee chaired by the Minister of Health himself, himself, even though we've had about two or three ministers since then, they've all taken it upon themselves to chair that committee. It also brings other development partners on the table to be part of the committee. Subcommittees were specifically uh, detailed to oversee a procurement, IENC training, human resource, and MNE. And these were some of the success factors that was uh, identified. Advocacy was a key strategy that we also adopted. And through orientation of key parliamentarians, policy makers, and associations, we got a few things uh, that we were never thought we would get. One was the maintenance of the free maternal health services, because as at the time, people were complaining of too expensive and we needed to cut it down. But eventually, it became part of the national health insurance and so law, and so it means that it's now going to be sustained. And through the advocacy, the government will declare family planning services to be free, to improve CPR and reduce unwanted pregnancies, and the policies are currently being put in place to commence that. We have been trying to decentralize, do tax shifting to ensure that we increase the, 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 uh, the, uh, the stakeholders or the staff that will come, uh, do family planning services. Through this, we're able to get auxiliary nurses to start inserting implants to improve access, especially for rural women who want family planning services. And currently, our, guy, uh, our president, unlike before, where it was the role of the first lady to champion maternal health, as the current president has agreed to champion maternal health and family planning services throughout the country. Some of the key things that was done was through partnership and resource mobilization, and the MDG Association Framework created a platform to bring all partners together and also help in resource mobilization. Out of that, we've been able to mobilize about 52 million grant from the EU, uh, another 23 million grants and loan from the Oreo funds, and potentially we have uh, the Dutch and Japanese also trying to come on board to support that, including the, the DFID. The COICA is also there supporting one region in MDG 5 and 4, and also supporting education as well as our midwifery uh, training schools in one of the regions. What have been some of the key achievements in these key areas that we talked about? Family planning, we've introduced some innovations to use mobile phones, mHealth, et cetera, to, to ensure that our data capture is appropriate at the lowest level and to prevent stockouts. District health information system is online and all districts are able to uh, enter their data and use information for better uh, services. The government of Ghana has increased its allocation to three million for the, uh, the support it normally gives to contraceptive procurement. Here to that was all uh, donor support and so has other partners, including DFI, they has also come in to support uh, that uh, procurement of commodities. We've also institutionalized uh, the advocacy week for family planning to also keep up support and, advocate and improve demand for family planning services. Skill delivery, we've done quite a lot, and um, one of the key areas has been the establishment of a staffing norm, even though small, it was quite a difficult thing to do, and that has also been able to do some benchmarking to ensure services are rendered. We've also increased midwifery production because one of the key challenges was the uh, inadequate number of midwives. We've increased um, the tutors, expanded the number of schools by eight in the last three years, and then the inter enrollment has increased from about 800 in 2010 to about 1,300 in 2012. Also, to boost the morale of midwives, we are organizing midwifery for that gives them technology, M-Health, et cetera, and they are also 
keeping their morale and helping in ensuring that they own the program and, and we are getting some success out of that. What has been some of the key areas for EMONC? We have conducted an EMONC assessment and we found all the challenges of only 2% of our basic was actually EMONC compliant and upgrading is currently ongoing. We've also reviewed our referral policy and the government has procured about 160 ambulances for emergency response and we are working in the private sector to, pick, uh, to transport pregnant women for free. UNDP is also supporting some hard to reach areas with equipment and ambulance to improve access in Imong and we scaled up the life saving skills and maternal death surveillance is available throughout the country at all levels and audit is done within seven days and notification within 24 hours. Some of the cross cutting issues has been building the capacity of the division charged with implementing these services because that was another weak point and that has been addressed. We are talking with uh, the mobile phone companies for, to improve M health and especially emergency response. And to also improve further governance, we are look, working on the sub account for maternal and child health. We didn't know how much we're actually spending on the maternal and child health services and also have put in a system that track resources for implementation of the MAF action plan. And also increase the media and IENC activities for demand generation and remove the myths and misconceptions about family planning. These are some of the key outcomes. We can see ANC has significantly increased, even the four plus is almost 85%, and skill delivery in the last 10 years has moved from 59 to nearly 70%. Family planning has also seen an increase from 17 to 23% of accepted modern methods, and the CYP has crossed more than that. A couple of years of protection, we are doing about 2 million. But as you look at the, the maternal mortality trend, we moved from 740 in the early 90s to 350 and the target of 185, which is still very high. But um, you can see that it is not really matching the, the, the gains in utilization, bringing into question the issue of uh, quality of care, as we mentioned this morning. We've done about 42% reduction, and our institutional maternal mortality rate has reduced from 230 per 100,000 to 150 in 23 in 20. Uh, 12. Some of the implementation challenges we've had include um, the, 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 the drive that at the, national, the international and national level has not really um, changed at the district and the lower level, and so we continue working on it to ensure that they also get the drive and the right attitude to ensure that the, the scale of phase is done. Road infrastructure generally has been a major bottleneck for MDG 5. Uh, in, in inadequate sector control uh, coordination, especially within the health sector and other um, ministry, department, and agencies such as the health, agriculture, education, have not been very good, and we're still working on that to ensure that we bring all together to, to improve implementation. Of course, then the lack of the lack of time between the preparation phase and the full implementation created that we lost a lot of momentum at the time because of funding and. Uh, Incidentally, uh, misunderstanding or inadequate understanding of the framework by other key managers, even the health sector, created some initial conflicts that we've had to address. What has worked well has been the implementation of the health systems and program interventions together. That brought everybody involved and yielded better results. Boosting the morale of the health worker, especially midwives, have uh, improved ownership at the implementation level. And the resource tracking system has improved compliance and adherence to the plans at all levels, especially in the districts and the regions. For us, our recommendations, uh, for, for our program, is want to focus attention on infrastructure and the health system challenge that's creating impact on the health system. Continue to reduce the out-of-pocket payment for maternal health service, because it has shown that it significantly reduced uh, inequities and that the poor are five times more likely to use the services than compared to the rich. Additional advocacy for the CSOs and domestic financial institutions are needed to help us uh, scale up forward and strengthen donor coordination and institutionalize the accountability systems that we have actually established currently. For our recommendation in the post-2015, uh, uh, we were of the opinion that momentum should not be lost on coming up with other new goals, 
which may take several years for us to understand. We must place an emphasis on access as well as quality issues as has been raised in our presentation. We should pay attention to equity issues. The national averages make disparities, uh, mask the disparity between the settings. And then MBG5, we are strongly advocating and should be categorized as a development issue that is intertwined infrastructure, ICT transportation, et cetera, and not just a health issue. And we must also ensure that governments show clear funding for maternal health uh, services across, uh, across the globe. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Abuagye. Now, our next speaker was due to be Dr. Vatana Sen, for Deputy Secretary General at the Council for Agricultural and Rural Development in Cambodia, but due to flooding in his country, he is unable to attend. However, I believe that some of the points he was going to raise will be addressed and included by comments made by our next speaker, Mr. Vinicius Spinello, the Deputy Director of the ILO, and he's in fact representing the ILO in the UN discussions related to the post-2015 development agenda. Mr. Panera, the floor is yours. Thank you. OK, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, the government of Korea and UNDP for inviting me to, to represent the ILO in this meeting. Uh, we all would also like to thank, to, thank the, to thank the UNDP for the partnership that we have in the in the discussions in the global thematic consultation on growth and employment. I think it was a very productive partnership. We're very proud of the results, uh, which, which are pretty much in line with the results of the One Million Voices that put uh, the quest for better job opportunities and also the quest for support to people who can't work, that means social protection, among the top 10 uh, priorities worldwide. And today, uh, I would like to talk about something that was already uh, mentioned this morning which is how, how not to leave no one behind. Because tomorrow, uh, this was something uh, that was mentioned by uh, Mrs. Greenspan, but also last week in the, in the General Assembly, uh, this expression echoed a lot in the, in our, in our, in the, in the, in the GA halls. Everybody's concerned on how, uh, not to leave, uh, how, how not to leave anyone be behind. And, um, and my point is, social protection floors is one of the main tools to ensure that people will be included in the post-2015 framework. So it's a way to implement this aspirational expression, this aspirational uh, will, collective will, on how to include uh, people uh, in the post-2015 uh, uh, development uh, framework. Uh, but before getting to that, I would just like to remind, to remind you that social protection has already been a tool in, in, in the finishing the Finnish business a framework that, uh, that Santanu uh, was explaining before. Social protection has been uh, used uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mark of the MDG1 on poverty and hunger, because as you know, uh, social protection is redistribution in the vein. Uh, it's, it's, it's the fastest way to, to, to improve uh, 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 poverty indicators to, to eradicate poverty, to, eliminate, to reduce poverty, and even to eradicate poverty, but also uh, affects uh, inequality in its sense, uh, because it's taken from one and, 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 and distributed to others. Uh, we also have learned that social protection uh, can stimulate labor force participation. Uh, there are many studies that, uh, uh, in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, showing how social protection can let people, can uh, support people in overcoming barriers to, to enter in, in, in the labor market and also to engaging uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, activities. Uh, the impact of social protection on, on food consumption nutritional level is also well known, so it has uh, many studies uh, produced by ILO, but also by the FAO, uh, by other agencies, by UNDP, uh, show uh, how social protection can uh, improve nutritional pros prospects. On the health uh, uh, MDGs, health-related MDGs, um, from the presentation of Patrick, we could also see uh, how social protection can improve uh, access to, to health services, uh, in particular uh, uh, preventive and curative care for, for child and for maternal, maternal health. The relationship between social protection support to HIV AIDS is in particular support to orphans is also well known. And 
uh, on education uh, in general empowerment, I mean, there are, there are lots of uh, evidence uh, showing the positive uh, impact, uh, in particular uh, in programs that link, for example, cash transfers with uh, uh, education attainment in school, enrollment rates, uh, such as the conditional cash transfers in Latin America, in Brazil, um, in Mexico. Uh, all these programs have shown uh, spectacular uh, uh, results in terms of uh, human development, in terms of uh, education, education uh, uh, indicators, and also in terms of reducing dropout rates and child labor. Gender empowerment is also something that is, uh, has been uh, highlighted in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the impact of some cash transfers that are targeted to women because they can stimulate a great labor force participation but also strengthen the human, human's position in the household. So the role of social protection in the MDGs framework and in particular accelerating the progress in, in, in finishing the business is quite well known. But for the future, um, uh, what we see, and that, that was very clear as well in the discussions of the Open Working Group uh, uh, last June, the fourth session of the Working Group was dedicated to employment, decent work, social protection, education, uh, health, uh, and youth, is that social protection can connect the dots of the sustainable development agenda. It's one tool that can connect the economic, the social, and the environmental uh, pillars of the sustainable development framework. The, from the crisis, we learned that social protection uh, can have a uh, spectacular role in terms of uh, stabilization of the economy. Uh, uh, in many countries that actually expand this protection as part of the stimulus package, uh, they, find, they found a way to, to smooth, not only to smooth the impact of, the, of, the, of the, the crisis on the most vulnerable people, but also to keep consumption and to keep boosting aggregate demand, to stimulate labor force participation, as I said before. In the long term, it, it can uh, increase uh, productivity, and it's a fundamental piece for uh, inclusive growth. Um, many studies, and, and unfortunately these are the studies uh, made only for developed countries, uh, have shown that actually for each dollar that you put social protection, you can get back from 1.8 to 2.5 dollars and increase GDP. So this is the multiplying um, uh, factor, the multiplying uh, uh, element of social protection uh, investment. So in the long term, social protection pays by itself. The social impacts are already well known, already uh, alluded to the, the, the social impacts in the slide before. And there is uh, an increasing uh, understanding and consensus on the possible impact of social protection uh, as a climate change mitigation and adaptation tool. Uh, and in particular, uh, as a tool to ensure a just transition to a more greener, to a more sustainable economy. We know that uh, uh, in, in the transition, uh, many people will just lose the jobs, jobs will disappear. But of course, jobs will be created in, in, in other sectors. So it's very important to have a, a social protection floor in place that can allow, uh, allow people you know, to get out of the labor market and, 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 and combine with training policies, combine with skills development policies, uh, acquire the skills that are required for insertion in, uh, in, in, in other uh, sectors that will increase uh, in, uh, in, in the future. You know? There are some uh, 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 um, estimations about the impact, and, and we say that uh, if the right conditions are in, are in place, we can create an, uh, up to 50 million do jobs of the next 10 years uh, uh, um, with the transition to a more uh, greener uh, economy. I'd just like to, to, to spend a little bit of time on this uh, uh, slide. It seems a bit Brazilian carnival, but uh, I think it's very interesting to see uh, how what's happening now. Yeah. And what's happening now is a truly a revolution in the global south. Because um, basically this, 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 uh, this slide shows how countries uh, extended their healthcare coverage over the last century. Yeah. And if you see that um, developed countries such as France, Germany, and, and even uh, late comers such as Portugal, uh, they took like a 50 to 60 years to build a comprehensive uh, healthcare system. The South, the South countries, of course, adopting different perspectives, different strategy. They are doing, in 10 to 20 years, what the developed countries took 50 to 60 years to do. So this is, by far, the fastest and largest process of social inclusion ever in this history. And we are very optimistic to say that it's likely to, uh, to increase. But of course, the model is different, uh, because in many countries, um, in the developed countries, what happened in, in the past was that, okay, uh, let's 
increase social protection for the formal sector. And let's give like a, 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 a Ferrari or a Porsche for those in the formal sector. And then as income per capita increases, we can extend this, this, this same formal sector coverage to the others. You know? So that, that's why it took too long. But what's happening now in the South is, is, the, is, 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 is a, is a, it's a quite different uh, 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 type of extension. Instead of offering everyone the same, they are paving, sorry, they are paving a floor of social protection for the informal, for the informal sector that covers also the, 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 the poor, and gradually increase this floor. So instead of offering the, the Ferrari for, for everyone, let's start by offering more popular uh, vehicle for, for people, and then as uh, GDP grows, as uh, income per capita grows, we can extend the, the quality of the, of the benefits that are in place. So this is this, what we call, we're calling the ILO, the social protection floor. And basically there is a, a, a framework for that, which is uh, quite anchoring the rule of law discussion, which is the ILO recommendation 202, which is the recommendation on national floors of social protection that was uh, adopted by International Labor Conference in 2012. And basically, uh, it defines the social protection floor as a set of, uh, of, of, of four transfers, of four, a combination of uh, income transfers and services that would ensure that all residents should have, have access to, to, to at least a defined set of, uh, of essential uh, healthcare services. All children should uh, enjoy a minimum uh, income security that could also facilitate access to other social services such as nutrition, education, and, and care. All people that cannot work, that cannot uh, uh, participate in the labor market should enjoy a minimum uh, income security. And all residents that are um, old age or with disabilities should also have a minimum income. So this is basically the definition of social protection floors. And this is what has been, many countries have been done uh, uh, so far. So basically, we are talking about four guarantees now. Healthcare, basic income security for children, basic income security for persons in active uh, age, uh, unable to, to work or to, to, to make an income, and basic income for old, old age uh, and, and disabled and people with disabilities. Um, and this is quite different uh, if you compare to the previous framework, to things that, we, that happened uh, in many of our countries uh, in the late uh, 90s, in the, in the late 80s, in the, in the 90s which is more this, the concept of social sa of, uh, safety net. In the safety net approach of the 90s, uh, the, the, the transfers, the social protection um, uh, provisions, they are temporary in the sense that they are in place just to mitigate the effect of a crisis or, for, or, or uh, a structural adjustment. And then when economies start to grow again, you can take out the, the, the social protection guarantee. In the case of protection frauds, we're talking about permanent uh, uh, transfers permanent rights, permanent access to, 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 to social protection services and, uh, and, uh, and transfers. In the safety nets approach, they are mostly compensatory. That means there was a structural adjustment, there was a liberalization process, there was uh, uh, some neoliberal uh, policies that were implemented. So in compensation, we give something for the pool so they don't feel so bad. In the case of social protection floors, uh, there is a prevention role, there's a protection role, and there is an empowerment role. So it's not a residual uh, element, but it's an integral a part of the economic model that is connected to increasing demand, but also to increasing productivity, investment, in human uh, capital. It's not needs-based, so not because they need, but because they have the right. So it's a rights-based approach. It's not fragmented, but it's integrated, it's coherent, and it's holistic. Uh, and and with the uh, recommendation 202, we also uh, put lots of emphasis on the need to have, to strengthen, to strengthen the rule of law. Because in many of the programs that uh, were implemented in the past, they were like created by governments or by, by at the national level, by the state, by, 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 by at state or municipal level. Sometimes it was like the first, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, they were like a lack of uh, total uh, institutionality. But here we're talking about provisions that are uh, guaranteed by law, by decrees, and by uh, a set of, uh, of regulations that are uh, very important uh, to put in place. Well, just to finalize, I'd just like to talk about uh, some challenges in terms of implementation of protection floors. 
The first one, of course, is the question that everybody asks. So who's going to pay for that? Is it, is it possible to, 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 to put it in place, in, uh, especially in low-income countries? And there, what we have been seeing, I mean, and this is, uh, this is uh, from findings from the ILO, but also from the World Bank, uh, ILO and the IMF doing work together, uh, HelpAge, uh, and other uh, uh, UNICEF and other institutions, UNDP, is that yes, it is affordable, even in low-income countries, and the key issue here is political will. Political will is the true uh, game changer of this process. And uh, it was very interesting last, last um, week, we organized a, 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 an event at the General Assembly about the inequalities of protection floor, and there was a representative from Norway. And, uh, and people say, okay, everybody uh, says, okay, Norway has a nice system, has, has a good system because they are rich. And then he said, no, we are rich because we put in place a system before. Yeah? So this is a, a clear uh, change in the mindset that to see sort of protection investment, not as something that we have to wait the, the, the cake to grow to divide uh, the benefits afterwards. Um, of course, there are many ways to do this. Uh, I mean, the, 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 it should be really a country uh, ownership and, and adapted to, 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 to the particular characteristics of each country. But one uh, way, for example, Bolivia, Bolivia is one of the poorest countries in Latin America. And Bolivia has a universal pension that's paid for everyone over 65, which is funded by a tax, a tax on, 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 uh, on, uh, on gas, on the, on, the, on the gas companies, which is a mineral-based taxation. Other countries are doing the same. Uh, so if Bolivia can do it, don't tell me that a country of higher, of higher uh, uh, income uh, cannot do it. Uh, of course, this is, should be uh, quite linked to the macroeconomic framework, but the most important thing, and I think this was also present in the, in the presentation by the World Bank uh, and also uh, by Shantanu, is that the need to increase uh, internal resource mobilization, uh, uh, to strengthen internal resource mobilization strategies. We cannot think that in the future the, the, the fund of social protection will come from abroad. Huh? Perhaps uh, international development and cooperation could help the startup. Uh, some systems, or even to provide uh, 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 cooperation in terms of, uh, of the implementation of the system, in terms of technolo technology transfer, or, or, or but, but the fund of the pensions, the fund, the fund for, the, for the health, uh, for the sort of protection for provisions themselves, they should be based on national resources. That's the only way that you have uh, uh, to, uh, th that you can ensure sustainability on the long term. Otherwise, it's just promise. Yeah? Well, I I have a, uh, some, I still have some slides, but I, I, I understand I'm, I've run out of time already. Uh, just just as, a, as a conclusion, um, here just some simulations uh, uh, that we did in some countries here around this region, for example, in Cambodia, uh, a social protection floor uh, would cost like 2% of GDP. Of course, uh, we need to do to discuss, I mean, they need to discuss how to, this could, could be fa funded. Uh, in, in Vietnam, it would be much higher the investment. Uh, and I understand Vietnam uh, is, from the, from the studies of the IMF, 6% uh, is too much for the moment, so perhaps a phasing strategy should be put in place in the future. Uh, uh, just as a sake of, for, uh, just to conclude, uh, I, ju uh, I think uh, what, what I, I uh, my main message is that if you really want to leave no one behind, one way to, to implement this wish is by extending social protection flaws. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Panero. Uh, our next guest will be Dr. Casimiro Abru. He's the Deputy Director General of the National Institute of Disaster Management in Mozambique and also one of the founders of the National Operational Emergency Center there. And he's gonna be talking to us about disaster risk and reduction in that country. Dr. Abru, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Republic of Mozambique, disaster risk reduction and the, the use of the yoke from away. First of all, I would like to thank 
the organizer for inviting Mozambique to participate in this conference and to congratulate the government of Korea to host this important event. I would like also to thank you for the opportunity given to Mozambique to share this presentation. As a background, a little background, Mozambique is located in the eastern coast of Central Africa. It is an area about 700 square kilometers and two, uh, about 3,000 kilometer coastline. This population is 20.5 million inhabitants, almost uh, women. 80.5% of the population are living in the rural aisle, remaining in the urban areas. More than 80% of the population depending on, on, on agriculture. The official language is Portuguese. Most of uh, as, uh, as I say, uh, we have a long coastline. Cyclones are most common hazards, flow floods, because we are receiving it all the other water rivers from interland along the, the country and the drought all, on, all over the country. Why the data and the use of HFA important to the National Development Contest? Risk reduction mainstream. National development drivers, normal state, recovery process following disasters, uh, planning, policies and legislation, organization structures, plans, public awareness, and we have other mainstream, poverty reduction, good governance, governance, environment sustainability. How is the HFA being used to support the implementation and strategic position at the national level? We identify natural hazard risk, evaluate the risks, we accept we ask accept the risks. If yes, we monitor and review. If no, we identify ways to prevent or manage risks, adaptation options. Priority adaptation options, incorporate the HFA uh, priority into national development plans, strategic policies, regulation, budgets, sector plans, programs, projects. What have been the results so far? Many achievements in the policy are included. Approval in December and uh, 2012 by the Council of the Minister of uh, the RMA Bill to be submitted to parliamentary in 2013. Approval in November 2012 by the Council of Ministers of the National Climate Change Strategy 2012-2025. That clearly is the five there are and the climate change adaptation is a national priorities. Approval in May 2012 by the Council of the Ministers, the new regulation that gave the implementation of the resident programs triggered by the development of economic and the social activities, particularly mining and the agriculture. Integration of the disaster risk in the national development strategy, which is under designed by the Ministry of Planning and Development aiming of uh, and the orienting the parts for the national development over the period 2015-2025. Achieve engagement of the United Nations agents in their um, activities, particularly in development of arid zone flood mitigation in the urban area and the cyclone mitigation over the coast areas. What have been the implementation of the HV challenge? Mozambique does not have yet sufficient and adequate human, technical and institutional capacity to plan and respond efficiently to major and national scale disasters. 
the vulnerability of social and economic infrastructure and of productive activity are still increasing. Choose them among other factors, the rapid development in risk area in the most recent years. There is an increased threat of disaster risk, floods, erosion in urban areas, mainly due to settlement and other development in flood risk areas, and as well coastal erosion due to lack of coastal protection. Early warning messages are still reaching the community at risk with some deficient ambiguity, for instance. This reality does not allow a well-informed decision-making process for, for instance, evacuation of people and goods to safe areas. What worked well in the implementation process? Collaboration and commitment between government agencies the private sector and the social civil organization in the disaster risk reduction. According to the existing regulation, the National Platform for DRM in the Disaster Management Technical Council, we call CTGC, and the members of the CCG are line minister. This is a political uh, make a decision plan, all the, almost of the ministers. Uh, technical de sector department, we have a meteorological department, INAM, uh, water management department, national director of geology, geodesy and mapping unit, food security and nutrition, technical secretariat, and the National Institute for Agrarian Research. Civil society platform, G20, a platform comprised of more than 4,000 national non-government organizations. Academy, Edward Mondrian University and the Mozambique Technical University, but the room is open for other universities engaged in the RR activity. United Nations agents, all the uh, United Nations agents are represented in the platform, women organization and the private sector. As you see, uh, as you see the map, the political decisions um, the Disaster Management Coordinating Council is leading by Premier Minister. In the, we have the partners around. We subdivided the, uh, the, the country by region, three regions, south, north, and the center. Uh, at the district at, at the level post. And the Disaster Management, we have the Disaster Management Technical Council by the, those all the areas, meteorology, fire, defense, so many. What was the progress? From the specific area of the YOG framework of Asia, the priority three, two and five, are those that register remarkable progress between the periods 29, uh, 2011, <coughs> and 2011 to 2013. As a result of the national commitment, the 2030 evaluation shows that Mozambique has made a significant progress in 54% of the 22 progress indicators. Priority 4 is the one that registered the minor progress during the period 2009 to 2011, and 2011 to 2013, while priority 1 kept stagnant. Recommendation moving forward with the post 2015 development agenda. Implement vigorously the disaster risk management bill. Continue with the implementation of the INGC master plan. Have approved and have started implementing the disaster risk reduction strategy. Establish a disaster risk reduction fund. Continue with the, the, the decentralization of the contingency plan funds to the local level, continuing improving the information quality and the flow, expanding the risk evaluation activity to different urban areas, establishing a capacity building plan for INGC and its operative organs, continuing creating the, creating the local disaster risk committees, create incentive for the local 
disaster management committees, continuing strengthening the participatory dialogue of the civil society and the disaster management process. Key message I would like to bring to this conference, Mozambique will not achieve sustainable development if there are priority are not translated into action and at all levels. Mozambique cannot achieve national development goals if key development sectors are not adequately protected from disaster and climate risk impacts. Only investment on their action and key development sector can reduce climate and disaster vulnerability of the national economic and the local community. There are, can only be systematically achieved if adequate technical, political, and the social capacity exists to assess risk and the vulnerability, implement, monitor, and evaluate the impact of federal and CC measures and activity across key sectors and the, the all levels. Thank you. Dr. Abru. Dr. Abru, thank you very much. Now, our next speaker was supposed to be Dr. Ana Isabel Nieta Gomez, the coordinator of El Salvador's National HIV AIDS Program. She's unable to be here, sends her apologies. She's made a video which will be available on the website along with all the other speakers' materials. So I'm going to now call on uh, April Golden, who's the Donor Relations Analyst for the Global Partnership for Education. She's going to be talking to us about education partnerships. Please, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to actually be a rebel and conduct my remarks from the seat. Um, I was thinking that actually the blessing and the curse of going last in a panel is that um, all of my colleagues have pretty much said everything that I was planning on saying, so uh, I hope I don't bore you with this conversation. Um, I believe I have a presentation. Uh, the Global Partnership for Education was formed in response to the Education for All agenda, uh, which served as the basis for the uh, more targeted MDG2. Uh, which in practice has had a nearly exclusive focus on increasing access to education. Now the MDGs um, themselves have provided a powerful framework in their simplicity and in galvanizing the world around a few development goals. Uh, however, in practice we've seen um, that there have been weaknesses and my colleagues did an excellent job of, of describing some of those weaknesses so I won't go into terms, um, into long terms with that. Um, but just to highlight the, um, in education, uh, as you'll see on the presentation, the enrollment targets actually um, set the bar pretty low um, and lost the entire breadth of the EFA agenda. While progress has been made in increasing enrollment rates, and it's gone up from 82% uh, in 1999 to 90% in 2010, uh, this masks real problems that education systems continue to face, uh, including especially the quality of education which facilitates learning, critical thinking, and acquiring skills that lead to jobs, amongst other things. For uh, the education community um, post-2015, the first challenge for us is going to be ensuring a level of ambition while retaining simplicity. Um, now, we've reached uh, some consensus over an overarching goal which addresses quality of education as well as increasing access and attention to equity, um, also highlighting lifelong learning perspective and skills for employment. Um, we also acknowledge that targets must be set in national context and realities, um, and that, of course, none of the goal setting will matter if there is no strong mechanism to monitor progress. And this is true for education as well as the other sectors. The high-level panel report on the post-2015 development agenda emphasized partnerships as key, recognizing the interconnectivity of development challenges. Um, as has been recognized uh, previously, few challenges are truly sector-specific, um, as well as the need for actors both within and outside of the sectors to work collaboratively and creatively to truly solve complex global problems. The Global Partnership for Education was mentioned in this report as an example of a multi-stakeholder partnership and practice to deliver quality education. Um, and this is the excerpt on the screen from the report. Um, I'm just going to go down to the la very last sentence, which says, GPE is single sector, but shows how collaboration can bring better results. Similar models might prove useful in other areas. 
The global partnership was mentioned in this report, we like to think, because of the unique model we use to bring all actors within the education sector together to align their resources in support of developing, implementing, and monitoring sound, country-owned national education sector plans. So I'm going to go a little bit into describing that model. Um, but first, I should say that the Global Partnership for Education is the only multi-stakeholder partnership that is focused solely on improving basic education in the poorest countries. The GPE model is based on a country-driven approach aimed at strengthening national education policies. The robustness of the model is based on the premise that the GPE does not duplicate existing resources and institutions at the national and global levels, but rather brings these resources and institutions together and strengthens them. Local education groups, which you see um, on the presentation on the left, composed of all of our stakeholders at the local level, is the primary group through which the GPE operates within countries, and GPE's national partners each play a role in the GPE process. And we have all of our partners, including donor governments, uh, domestic governments, uh, the private sector, civil society, uh, teachers, uh, teachers' organizations, and, uh, and, and all of the development partners um, as a part of that local education group. The local education groups are collaborative forums for policy dialogue and for the alignment and harmonization of technical and financial support for education sector policy, planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation, and accountability. And through um, this partnership, we achieve quite a bit. I'm just going to highlight a few, uh, including developing education strategies and programs, promoting collaboration, and financing um, sound education sector plans. So I'm going to go straight into some of the challenges that the Global Partnership has faced in implementation. And before I go into these, I want to emphasize that um, the very short list I have is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, but rather, I really want to highlight two very salient challenges uh, we've encountered in terms of implementing the goals of the partnership. Um, and if anybody wants to talk further about some of the other challenge, specific challenges our partners face, I'd be happy to speak with you afterwards um, over coffee. Um, later. GPE's role as a multi-stakeholder partnership is not about defining what countries want to achieve, but to facilitate a credible process at country level which will result in an appropriate and democratic dialogue and to support the how, not the what, of addressing challenges in the education sector. So these challenges um, that I'm going to talk about, uh, and this should come as no surprise, and I believe several colleagues before me have mentioned both of these, um, but ensuring inclusive stakeholder dialogue amongst all of our partners, um, as well as ensuring strong data and evidence. And I want to go into these a little bit more in depth um, and then spend a little bit of time talking about how uh, the Global Partnership is attempting to address some of these challenges. So the first one, ensuring stakeholder, uh, inclusive stakeholder dialogue. We found two elements that are essential for the success of our policy cycle. Strong political will and a participatory approach that ensures the involvement of all key actors in the education sector. Education reform takes time to implement, yet is subject to frequent change. A sector plan developed by a government alone or just with the support of consultants and development partners is vulnerable on several fronts. The very stakeholders on whom implementation depends have little knowledge of the plan or their role in implementing it. Involving CSOs, teacher organizations, private sector partners, all of these groups within local education groups gives education reforms greater relevance and credibility, broader ownership, and deeper roots. However, this can be incredibly challenging for a variety of reasons, including the capacity of these key groups, particularly civil society, teachers' organizations, and sometimes even the government itself, to actively contribute to the conversation. And even when strong coordination mechanisms are in place, conflicting agendas, personality differences, and other factors can negatively affect collaboration. Especially challenging, at least for the education sector, has been to include some of the newer partners who are engaging in development within the local, edu local education group di policy dialogue process. And this includes private sector and corporate partners, uh, emerging or non-OECD DAC donors, and, and others. Moving on to the second challenge, ensuring strong data and evidence. 
Um, reliable data, as we've all mentioned and we all understand, are critical for the development of a credible education sector plan. In order to understand the context of the environment and also to set targets for improving cost and finance, access, learning, equity, efficiency, and system capacity. This is another area where capacity of various partners can impede the ability to collect data to assess progress or even to set a baseline um, from which to start. Lack of data can lead to inappropriate or incomplete plans and a misappropriation or lack of services. In Rwanda, for example, we found that uh, setting up a digital system um, where one had previously not been for tracking the decentralization and procurement of textbooks um, was a key factor in schools receiving their materials on time and on budget, uh, where before they were lucky to have seen them at all. Um, and just setting up this system um, was, was a huge factor in the success of that, that program. So I want to move on um, to how GPE is addressing these challenges. Um, and the, the, three, the three things that I'm going to talk about actually um, work to address both of those challenges in terms of in, including all um, partners in, in the dialogue process uh, as well as the, the data issue. Um, the first thing uh, we're doing um, is that we're providing uh, support, targeted support to our local education groups. Um, for instance, we're, we're increasing the technical support from the GPE secretariat side in terms of uh, increasing number of staff as well as increased interaction with partner countries for technical support. We're also placing more emphasis, emphasis on support to education policy development and implementation rather than simply program development, encouraging the setting of action plans and targets and other areas to monitor progress. We're also providing support to monitoring and capacity building workshops designed to capacitate ministry teams and development partners to systematically monitor implementation with an emphasis on, in, on the importance of the use of efficient tools and uh, the use of tools as mentioned earlier by one of my colleagues. Um, for the education uh, sector, these tools could include action plans, implementation reports, uh, joint sector monitoring reviews, uh, local education group activities, and a variety of others. We're also working to improve data collection and monitoring um, at the, uh, the national level. Uh, for instance, we're increasing the support to in-depth sector analyses in terms of financing where other partners were covering these costs before. We're now actually um, proposing to, to foot the costs for sector analyses. We're also putting increased emphasis on data within the GPE grant application process, requiring data to be provided to UNESCO's UIS for GPE grant applications, or that a strategy to provide this data um, is in place, um, this could also be financed by us within our grant process. We're also targeting direct involvement in the monitoring of the education sector plan implementation through joint sector monitoring reviews and other, other um, initiatives. Uh, another way that we're addressing these challenges um, is a very targeted support um, to include a, a group that's sometimes often, often left out of the policy dialogue process and that's civil society. Um, so the, the Global Partnership for Education is supporting civil society on their role, particularly in, the, in oversight and accountability uh, through what, a fund that's called the Civil Society Education Fund and we've been doing this for the past four years. Um, we have seen results from this. For example, in Kenya, GPE's support to the CSO coalition enabled them to provide consistent inputs to education sector plans and policies, influencing policies for greater accountability and leading to increased trust and collaboration between CSOs and the education ministry. Uh, most recently, actually, this past December, uh, GPE committed $14.5 million to the next iteration of CSEF. And we have the opportunity moving forward to build on what has already been done, uh, including placing a stronger emphasis on social accountability mechanisms that will ensure that whatever targets are set, they respond to the needs of the poorest. So um, my presentation has been short because I know that we um, were supposed to keep to short times. But uh, in conclusion, what I, I just want to emphasize that what GPE tries to do, um, and this is something that has come up constantly in uh, conversations today is to ensure that partners work together collaboratively in a coherent way behind a, a common national, nationally owned plan 
um, including a robust approach to financing. Um, and it has been mentioned also before by my colleague from the World Bank that um, uh, the ODA investment is declining worldwide, which is a worry for us. Um, and, and ODA investment in education in particular um, has been declining. And so um, one of the responses that, that, that we have actually is to integrate within our next replenishment campaign, which is, um, has been launched, was launched at the UN General Assembly a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, targeted support and a call to action for targeted support for increases to support to education, both in, in terms of the GPE fund, as well as increases in bilateral support to education, um, as well as, and I have a slide on this, um, increases in domestic education budgets, um, the, uh, the support uh, to those as well. Um, and I apologize for the shameless plug there. Uh, finally, partnerships can only work where there are agreed accountability mechanisms in place to ensure that each partner is contributing to mutually agreed goals. By creating an inclusive partnership framework which gives voice to civil society stakeholders and which emphasizes transparency, dialogue, joint monitoring, and collective account for progress, the GPE model can inform what should be a central tenet of the new development goals the need for much stronger mechanisms grounded in social accountability to audit progress against a set of new development goals, particularly if the global community is to succeed in reaching the hardest to reach. Thank you. Thank you, April Golden, and thank you to all our panelists for their insights and perspectives. I'm sure you'll agree that the uh, comments demonstrate the breadth of development frameworks that are being implemented in countries around the world. But what are the lessons learned and the challenges that arise from these examples? What notes of warning do they sound for implementing the post-2015 agenda? How do we future-proof the post-2015 development agenda? Let's open this up to some questions from the floor, from you guys. Do, uh, I'd like you to raise your hands if you have a question that you'd like to ask. Uh, and then people with microphones will come around and I'll spot you and I'll get you to introduce yourself and direct your question to a panelist or leave it to the entire panel. So if you have a question, we have some minutes now to ask questions, please raise your hand. Nobody has a question. This gentleman down here at the front, thank you, sir. If you could just stand up and introduce yourself and tell us. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Habib Mayar uh, from Afghanistan, but working at the G7 Plus Secretariat in Timor-Leste. Uh, I have just gotten a couple of question, uh, comments and just a question uh, to the entire panelists and also the colleagues who speak, uh, spoke earlier. Uh, actually, uh, the, the high-level panel report, which was, it brings a kind of hope. Uh, the chair of the G7 Plus was one of the members of the panel. And we really advocate for the peace building and state building goals uh, to be incorporated in post-2015. If we are really talking about uh, the inclusivity and also leaving no one behind. I'm talking on behalf of the 1.5 billion people who are living in fragile and conflict-affected states. Uh, one of the panelists mentioned about the universality of the plan or the framework. That's true, but when it comes to the implementation, I think it really matters what happens at the national level. And if we, we really talked about uh, the uh, sustainable development, but we did not talk about the sustainability of the impact of the development. Even those countries which have achieved some of the MDG benchmarks, including some of the FCS countries, uh, we wonder that whether the government or the institutions will be able to maintain them. So the questions of the institutional building really comes to the core of the issue. I think this is one, something that we have to uh, take into account. And secondly, unless we support the institutions as a foundation, I don't think so that we can sustain those achievements that we have achieved so far. Uh, and my Second question about, uh, sorry, just a question, the first question, is the, we talked about the accountability. I was wondering that how can we link this to the political, the real political game, uh, which, is, which includes the regional, the global, and the national political uh, issues. Uh, we have been talking about the effectiveness of the, of the development intervention, but it, is really, uh, it really depends on how politically we are committed to that, whether that is the environmental issues, whether that is peace and conflict issues, uh, how we can in translate these to, into the headquarters of our countries who are involved in the political business. Thank you so much. Is there somebody in particular that you'd like to direct that question to? 
Uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, just one of the panelists mentioned about the accountability that we need to have uh, a great focus on the accountability. So that question is directed to that panelist in the previous okay. panel. Well, thank you. Let me um, let me pick one of our panelists now to put the spotlight on. Um, um, Mr. Panera from the ILO, uh, would you like to tackle that question about accountability? How do you actually get accountability? I mean, or rather, how politically committed do you think governments are to accountability? Yes, thank you very much for, for that question. I think Shantanu can also perhaps uh, come up. For us, uh, for the ILO, we're very comfortable when talking about the accountability because we are a tripartite institution. We, we, have, uh, we are accountable not only for, uh, to governments but also to employers uh, and to workers. And in particular, uh, in, in respect to the social protection uh, issue that I would like to, 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 uh, to address your question in, in light of what uh, I just said, uh, for us, uh, the participation of uh, all stakeholders in the process of design and implementation and monitoring of the, of the, of the, of the, of the social protection force is a fundamental uh, element in the, uh, in, 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 uh, to, to make it uh, uh, successful. Um, and there are many examples. Uh, for example, uh, Cambodia, it's a pity that Mr. Uh, Sun is not here with us. But in Cambodia, uh, the strategy for extension of protection was uh, um, uh, elaborated by a committee uh, composed by all stakeholders, including um, employers, workers, uh, but also beneficiaries and representatives of the of the of the civil society um, and other sectors, uh, and this strategy uh, has been uh, discussed, and they created an accountability committee uh, uh, to exactly to, to to monitor the implementation of this strategy. For that, so the, the response is participation is fundamental uh, to, to guarantee the successful implementation of the social protection policies. But how committed do you think governments, sorry to put you on the spot, I know it's not your issue, but how committed do you think governments are to make the post-2015 development agenda truly accountable? Yeah, That's always a, a problem, a, isn't it? Yeah, now I think, of course, it depends pretty much on each, uh, on each government. In the case of uh, social protection, the, the creation of such um, mechanisms, such boards, such uh, uh, tripartite, and, and uh, structures, they can help in enhancing accountability. Okay, thank you, and thank you for the question. Does anybody else have a question? There's a couple over here. Some hands going up now, good. Okay, that gentleman uh, at the back there, yes. Would you like to stand up, introduce yourself, and tell us what your question is? Thank you. Um, my name is Peter. Um, from Rwanda, a country student from uh, Korea University. Um, my question is, uh, I would like to, to address to uh, Ms. Rebecca, uh, Associate Administrator, UNDP. Um, you mentioned about uh, uh, how uh, post-millennium development goal, but uh, if you remember well, on July, the panelists discussed about the disparities of uh, about uh, the working condition with the uh, UN uh, agencies, like if other implementing partners how um, they uh, differentiate in working environment. Like, let's say you find that the goals, one goal is working in one district, and uh, you find that there is some uh, other goals are left behind. Like, three or NGO are working in one district with, let's say, like poverty or education, but in other areas, they are not working together. So the collaboration with NGOs and UN, UN implement partners are different. So uh, the question is, that how do you think this the post-millennium development goal, if the UN itself is not monitoring the, the implementing, uh, implementation of the objectives, and uh, today you are coming up with UN uh, policies again, how do you think this will overcome, will you achieve, if you are not going to have a collective ways of harmonizations of your project, how you implement the objectives? Thank you. So, just let me check, who are you asking that question to? Uh, Rebecca. Uh, the Associate okay. administrator, okay. Unfortunately, Ms. Greenspan is in a bilateral meeting right now and is not in the room to answer that question. So I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to wonder if you could hold on to that question until the afternoon session when she will be in the room. Would you be able to do that? If anybody who was discussing about the UN uh, 
the post-millennium development goal, if we can answer the question, it would be good. Thank you. Um, well, very briefly, as we do have to uh, wrap up then, I'm going to put uh, Dr. Mukherjee on the spot here uh, to address this issue of monitoring of implementation of objectives. Mm. I think uh, we have to be clear, the post-2015 development agenda is not framed as yet. And uh, I think uh, it's a little bit premature to talk about monitoring the implementation of something which is still in the making. But uh, I would say that if you do look at the experience with the MDGs, which is the only global development agenda we have as yet, uh, the experience of the system has not been a bad one. There have been MDG reports at countries, the national monitoring, and civil society has actually played a very important role through its shadow MDG reports in putting the pressure on national governments to revise benchmarks or uh, actually bring items on the agenda. And I think that civil society role is going to continue if you ask the question of why certain MDGs have traction, why some don't. Uh, I think it's very important for us to distinguish roles for all of the players where they can be most effective. Thank you. Okay, we do sort of need to start thinking about wrapping up now, but if somebody has one very specific, very short question directed to a specific member of the panel, then I'm going to give you one minute to do the question and the answer. This lady over here, this does need to be very specific. Hello, my name is Catherine. I'm from Guatemala, and this question is for Mr. Pinero. Um, you said about political will is the game changer, and I, I totally agree. But how can you achieve these social programs like in developing countries when governments change like almost every four years? And new governments want to do the opposite of the past government. So that's what I see in my country and another developing country. So it's a good question. You. Mr. Bonero, I need you to answer this in 60 seconds. No pressure. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for, for this question. Uh, what uh, the experience uh, has shown, and uh, I think the case of Latin America is quite illustrative, is that uh, well succeed, successful experiences, actually uh, they, they continue because the, 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 the new governments, they tend to, to build on, on what has, done, has been done before because they are under the scrutiny of uh, the scrutiny of the, of the of the voters. So voters, they they uh, they vote for those who keep the programs. For it. That, is, that, is, that is the case, for example, of uh, opportunities in Mexico. In Mex Mexico, has just changed government, and the new government is not uh, proposing to 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 to, to finish the program, to disappear the program, but to improve the program and scale up the program according to new priorities. So what's what's happening now is exactly this. And the, Instead of changing um, uh, totally the priorities and, and uh, according to, to the governments, they are building on what has, has been done by the previous government. Okay, thank you for the question. Thank you for the brevity of the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes session two. Uh, for those having lunch in the foyer, you need your name badges. Your coupon for lunch is in the name badge, I'm told. Um, so please go ahead and enjoy that. Don't forget to check out the Korea UNDP MDG Trust Fund uh, table over there as well. And we will start again with session three after lunch at two o'clock. Thank you very much.